Chapter 13, Vital Signs of Monitoring Devices. So we're going to talk about five of the, the main vital signs throughout this chapter. However, the scope of practice for an EMT has been expanded, especially within the state of Illinois. So we're going to continue in class and we're going to talk beyond the, the five that we discussed during this uh, lecture here. We're also going to include entitled in CO2 monitoring and a few other components. So understand that this is just going to be a basic introduction to some of the more simple vital sign uh, vital sign acquisitions. So why do we do vital signs? What does that help? Uh, let me first explain that vital signs do not give us any information that we need to determine what's truly wrong with our patients and how to treat them. Okay, Vital signs offer a little bit of insight into the overall status or condition of the patient, uh, their underlying severity, but vital signs should not be used to try to gather clues as to what's going on with our patient. We need to be able to perform a good comprehensive sample assessment in order to do that. And that's something we'll talk a little bit more or a lot about actually in chapter 14. But just keep that in mind as you are interacting with your patient, as you are working through the assessment algorithms, you have the discretion on when you should be doing vital signs, when you should be doing a hands-on assessment, when you should be asking uh, sample or OPQRST questions. So that's all at your discretion. That's all based on your, um, your overall impression and how you determine that you should run that call. Now, as you make that determination, you should understand that by asking questions, gathering information and history, um, and by physically assessing your patient, those things will clue you in much, much more to the underlying condition of your patient than any level of vital signs will. Now, vital signs are important. You know, as we assess blood pressure and, and pulse rate and quality and, and regularity and everything else, these things all clue us in as to how our patient's doing. And we can use some vital sign clues to help us, or I should say, to help reinforce our theories on what could be wrong with our patient. But these alone won't save a life. They won't tell us exactly what's going on underneath. So we should always be focusing on that sample history and that physical assessment as a higher priority than vital signs. If we do have the resources available to us where we can multitask, and if I am able to ask sample history questions, my partner is able to obtain vital signs, and another provider is able to do a physical assessment, sure, that's fine. Do it all in tandem. But more often than not, we are working under limited resources with limited personnel. So vital signs should not be a high priority for us ahead of that physical assessment or sample history. So talking about the different vital signs, we have five different primary vital signs, including pulse, respirations, skin color, pupils, and blood pressure. Each of those clue us into something a little bit different. And collectively, as we, we put all of our findings together, we can start to identify commonalities between different underlying conditions. But at the end of the day, we still need to develop the patient's chief complaint. We need to physically touch our patients to determine what's wrong with them. And we need to gather a good comprehensive sample history. So the first set of vital signs that we get, we want to get relatively quickly within the first few minutes of patient interaction. And those are going to be used as our baseline vital signs or what the patient has at the very beginning. Each time we repeat our vital signs, which could be anywhere from every couple minutes to maybe 10 or 15 minutes, we're going to compare those to the last set. And we're going to uh, overall trend that information. We're going to look at all of our vital signs together and look at how they're changing over time. As the blood pressure drops and the pulse goes up and the respiratory rate drop, uh, goes up, those three com or that combination of those three items tells me that there's a good chance that my patient is going into shock. So again, it allows me to to clue into what could be going on with that. Now, I need in conjunction with that, not just those findings, but I need to look at my patient and observe skin parameters. I need to identify was there a potential mechanism of injury or nature of illness that could lead to the potential shock? What are my patient's complaints? You know, so again, there's, there's a very big picture and that picture is cut up into small puzzle pieces. Each vital sign represents only one small puzzle piece, and we have to ask all those questions and look at those physical assessments to fill in the rest of the picture. So talking about pulse, palpable pressure of the heart beating. There's a difference between heart rate and pulse. 
the heart rate is actually the electrical activity within the heart. So if I were to place my patient on a monitor and monitor their heart rhythm, that would be the electrical activity that would give me their heart rate, saying that there are 90 electrical complexes per minute. That means that their heart rate would be 90. Now under normal circumstances, for each electrical complex, there should also be a corresponding contraction of the left ventricle that generates a wave of pressure throughout the blood vessels, which we call a pulse. So theoretically, the pulse and the heart rate should in fact be the same, but they do have very different meanings. And there are instances where the heart rate may be normal or may be one thing, and the pulse may be entirely different or even absent. And that's something that we call pulseless electrical activity. So we should differentiate between pulse and heart rate, um, and we need to not just look at a monitor to determine what our patient's uh, pulse rate is, but we actually need to feel that pulse, right? We need to palpate it at the radial site, femoral site, brachial site, carotid site, you know, whichever site is most appropriate, and then we need to compare. Is the pulse rate the same as the heart rate? And if not, why is that? So as we palpate the pulse, we're not only evaluating its presence, but also the quality. Is it strong? Is it weak? Is it regular? Or is it irregular? And there's a lot of times that I could walk up to a patient, check a radial pulse, and ask them, do you have a history of AFib? Because as soon as I walk up and they're talking to me and I'm checking their pulse, I feel that the, whole, the pulse is really irregular. And that's something that typically corresponds with a, a pre-existing diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. The pulse points that we are using are arterial sites that are close to the, the surface of the body. Typically, arteries are buried deep within the body because they're so important and they carry such a large volume of blood, the body is, has positioned them to protect them. And a lot of times they run deep within the muscles, um, closer to the bones, areas that are further from the surface of the body, thereby making it very difficult to feel those pulses. But there are certain sites where if we uh, do it appropriately, we can feel the pressure waves going through the arteries. And again, those are going to be sites like radial, brachial, carotid, um, pedal, or uh, even the popliteal or femoral. So here we see an EMS provider assessing the radial pulse site. And the practice of actually doing so, going through these skill sets, are all things that we're going to do in the classroom. Now the pulse rate should be between 60 and 100. Anything that is outside of that range may not necessarily be abnormal, but we would need to look at the overall patient's condition in conjunction with that. For instance, I work with a, a gentleman who is very physically active. Um, he does jujitsu, he does a lot of cardio work, works out all the time, and he, overall he's in very good shape. He has a resting heart rate in the upper 40s to lower 50s. Now, there are some patients that if they had uh, a resting, or I'm sorry, a, a heart rate in general of, of 40 something to 50 something, they could be hemodynamically unstable, and we may need to actually start doing some pretty intense ALS interventions, but not for him. And that just further illustrates that each patient is, is different. Each patient is independent, and we need to look at each pa patient differently and not just focus, on, focus in on any one puzzle piece. Um, same thing, you know, if I go and I jump on a treadmill right now and I spend 20 minutes on the treadmill, my heart rate's probably going to be 130, 140 beats per minute. That's not abnormal because of the exercise, right? That's just simply meeting the oxygen demands of the body. But if I were just simply laying in bed resting and I hadn't done anything and I had a heart rate of 130 or 140, that would be a, a pretty big red flag. So looking at not just who the patient is, but what the underlying circumstances are, what were they doing leading up to this event? These are all equally important things that will help fill in each one of those little puzzle pieces. So tachycardia is a rate above 100. That's 101 and above would be considered tachycardia. Bradycardia would be below 60, so 59 and below. Anything that hits the number 60 or the number 100 and anything in between would be considered normal for an adult. Now keep in mind that with children, the rates are different, and you're going to need to really evaluate what is considered normal for the different age groups. And I can tell you that the younger the child is, the faster their pulse rate is. As a brand new baby, as a newborn, we would expect a pulse rate in the ballpark of probably 150, give or take. 
As the child gets older and grows into adulthood, the heart rate continuously starts to slow down. And as they become elderly, uh, we see heart rates typically that are going to be in the uh, lower 60s. And that, in conjunction with beta blocker medications that a lot of Americans are on, we start to see uh, pulse rates that really do hover right around 60 in those later age groups. So the pulse rate at 120 or above, um, or 50 and below, these are things that could be considered serious findings. But again, like I just said, we need to look at our patient's underlying conditions, the things leading up to that, their unique uh, condition that they may be in, and determine whether or not that is or is not actually a problem. Talking a little bit about pulse quality. So as the left ventricle contracts, it forces that, that wave of pressure, that wave of blood out of the left ventricle. And it has to overcome that systemic vascular resistance. Or if you remember that SVR is the amount of pressure within the peripheral blood vessels that the left ventricle has to overcome in order to pump blood. And that again uh, corresponds to the systolic and diastolic pressures. So your systemic vascular resistance is your diastolic pressure. That's the bottom number in your blood pressure. And your left ventricle has to overcome that to pump blood. And as it pumps blood, as it contracts, it pumps out at the systolic pressure, or which is the top number in the blood pressure. And it generates that pulse wave as it travels throughout the vessels. By maintaining adequate, quality, or adequate pressure, it allows for the perfusion of oxygen into the, the different tissues and into the cells. So looking at the overall pulse quality, we want to feel it. Is it good and strong? When we have super weak pulses, a lot of times that's an indication that the, the blood pressure may be lower or the cardiac output may be affected one way or another. And we look at the different pulse sites and think about each pulse site and its distance from the heart. So things like the pedal or radial sites are furthest from the heart, whereas something like the carotid or femoral sites are much closer. So one way that we can assess blood pressure, and let's be honest, we may not always have time or the tools. What happens if our blood pressure cuff breaks, right? How can we assess the quality of blood pressure and the overall perfusion status without actually taking a blood pressure? Well, if they have a, a strong radial or pedal pulse, that tells me that the heart is pumping enough blood to effectively distribute it through all parts of the body, right? Because it can get from the heart all the way down to the feet and everywhere in between. So that tells me that their blood pressure is probably effective in order to perfuse all the tissues throughout the body. If the radial or pedal sites are absent, but I do have a femoral site, that says, okay, I'm pumping enough blood at a, at a good enough pressure to get all the way down into the groin area. So that tells me that the distance from the heart to the groin, everything in there is being perfused, and that's also going to be uh, that's also going to be appropriate to perfuse the brain and other vital organs. In the absence of that femoral pulse, the last pulse site I have is that carotid site, right? As I check inside the neck there, all I know if I have a carotid pulse is that I'm able to, to perfuse the brain, but I have serious issues as to whether or not uh, the body is perfusing other important organs such as the kidneys, uh, the pancreas, the liver, the kid, uh, spleen, and everything else. So I look at pulse sites, the overall strength of the pulse, and that will clue me into the underlying perfusion quality. Now if I couple that along with skin parameters and the patient looks really pale or something like that, that tells me, okay, I'm probably having some perfusion problems. Regular versus ir irregular typically corresponds to the patient's cardiac conduction system and what might be going on with the electrical impulses. So we just talked about uh, strong and weak here. Uh, the term thready is used to describe weak pulses. And the only way I can describe that is rather than feeling a, a good firm thud with each pulse, you instead feel kind of a swoosh of blood that travels past that pulse site there. And that's usually an indication of severe hypovolemia. Uh, They've got uh, a huge depletion of their overall blood volume stores, and we need to treat that patient very aggressively. So we've talked a lot about the different pulse sites, things that we've talked about in the past, so I'm not going to go over that stuff again. Um, one thing I do want you to remember, though, is that with young children, infants, and small toddlers, we are using the brachial site. That's going to be one of the easier sites to obtain a pulse in those children.
There's a picture of it right there. We would go just below the bicep muscle on either arm in order to palpate that. The carotid site is going to be best for unconscious patients where we need to determine whether or not CPR is appropriate. So if my patient's laying there, they're not moving, they're not responding to me, I'm going to go straight to that carotid site. Conversely, if the patient's awake and talking, uh, simply walking up and grabbing my patient's neck, as you can imagine, would be slightly less appropriate. So that's where I would want to use something like the radial site, slightly less invasive and more comfortable for my patient. As we assess the pulse, uh, we're going to uh, count the number of thuds that we feel, and we're going to do that over the course of 30 seconds. <coughs> we take that number, we multiply it by 2, and that gives us our overall pulse rate. Now, you know, if the patient is conscious, alert, and oriented, times 4, um, everything looks normal. We'll, we're just simply doing vital signs as a formality, but we don't suspect any underlying uh, traumatic or medical conditions, then it wouldn't be inappropriate to count um, the, the pulses for the, over the course of 15 seconds, and then multiply that by four. At the same time, if my patient's in really bad shape, they've got this irregular pulse, it's difficult to palpate, then I may need to go for a full 60 seconds to determine the pulse rate and, and evaluate it because, you know, sometimes those irregularities make it difficult to really determine, you know, an accurate count. So we do it for as long as we need to, based on the overall patient's condition and just how incredibly accurate we need that number to be. So moving into respirations then, uh, respirations as you remember is the actual exchange of gases at the alveolar level. We are in fact as we observe chest rise and we count that we are counting the patient's ventilatory rate. Similar to heart rate and pulse rate which you've heard me use interchangeably already in this this conversation, respiration and ventilation are oftentimes used interchangeably. As the patient breathes and we see that chest rise, we assume that respiration is actually occurring inside the lungs. But if there are things that suggest that may not be the case, we have to consider that. So if the patient is ventilating at 16 times per minute, right, we count chest rise 16 times over the course of 60 seconds, yet the patient doesn't appear to, you know, if, if they are cyanotic or if they're pale, or if they're in overall distress, then maybe the ventilatory rate is not matching the actual exchange of gases or the respiration rate. So we have to again look at the big picture here and not focus in on any one single clue. We're going to count the respiratory rate and we're going to do that again over the course of 30 seconds and multiply by 2. In some situations, again, it may be appropriate to go all the way up to six, uh, 60 seconds, getting a single number, and rarely is it ever going to be acceptable to only count the respiratory rate over 15 seconds. Because the normal respiratory rate um, for an adult places anywhere from 5 to 6 seconds between each breath, simply counting for 15 seconds and multiplying by 4 does not give us a very accurate number at all. So you should be spending a full 30 seconds on each uh, respiratory evaluation, counting the number of uh, breaths that the patient takes. We're also going to identify or assign a label to the respiratory rate, identifying it as slow, rapid, or normal. Bradypnea is the medical term for slower. Uh, tachypnea is the medical term for fast. And then we can just simply say normal or within normal limits if it's within the appropriate range. Similar to uh, pulse, the respiratory rate changes with time. Young babies are breathing as newborns about uh, 40 to 50 times per minute, and then as adults, our respiratory rate slows down to 12 to 20, again with different rates um, being indicative of different patient conditions, um, their underlying cardiovascular conditioning, and everything else. But the normal rate for an adult is between 12 and 20. Anything well outside of those ranges, I have reason for concern. Now, it is much more acceptable for that to be outside the range um, to be higher than 20, not so much lower than 12, though. So again, if I jump back on that treadmill and I've got my pulse rate up, I would expect my respiratory rate to increase also. And it would not be uncommon, nor would it be a big deal for somebody who just finished exercising to be breathing 28, 30, even 32 times per minute. As a matter of fact, that's natural and it's purposeful in order to help balance the oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in the body. However, 
anytime a rate drops down below 12, I am very concerned. Respiratory rates of, of 8 or even 6 or below are considered inadequate. And in those circumstances, I probably need to get my BVM out and start ventilating those patients. So again, I've got a wide range. I can go well above 20 and not be overly concerned. Uh, but if I drop below 12 at all, that's kind of a big deal. And a lot of times those patients require aggressive therapies. So four different categories that we can utilize to describe the respiratory quality. Those being normal, shallow, labored, or noisy. Um, normal is obviously self-descriptive. Shallow determines or describes the overall chest rise, and it shows that there's not going to be a lot of rise, that they're not exchanging adequate volume of air. Labored means that they're actively struggling to breathe. You can see them working hard using accessory muscle uses uh, in their neck, maybe retractions within the, uh, the ribs. Maybe they're in the tripod position, uh, nasal flaring, pursed lips, all those things would clue us in to labored. And then we also have noisy breathing, which could be stridorous, wheezing, or other issues like that. We also assess the overall rhythm or regularity of respirations, looking to see are they regular or irregular. And a lot of times when we have irregular respiratory patterns, uh, that is going to be indicative of some type of head trauma that impacts the, the brainstem. The brainstem, or more specifically the medulla oblongata, uh, controls the overall respiratory functions of the body. When the respiratory rate is super irregular, that clues me into the possibility of some type of neurologic issue, possibly from head trauma, intracranial pressure, or infection. Moving on to the skin parameters. Now, when we talk about skin color, we're not necessarily talking about black, white, brown, or anything else that would signify race or ethnic background. What we're discussing is the, uh, the color indicators as to whether or not the skin is adequately being perfused. And what that oftentimes refers to, or it allows us to, uh, it clues us into, is the vasoconstriction or dilation of the blood vessels within the skin. Anytime that we have a circulatory issue, if, if we have circulatory compromise due to depleted blood volumes, um, hemorrhaging, uh, or any other issue where the, the core vital organs aren't being perfused appropriately, the body takes automatic steps to constrict the blood vessels within the periphery, especially within the skin. And by doing so, it shunts the blood back toward the core of the body. So anytime that the patient uh, appears really pale or diaphoretic, uh, that tells us that there's most likely vasoconstriction that's occurring in the vessels within the skin. And what that means is that the skin is no longer being perfused appropriately. It becomes very porous and allows the, the water within the skin to leak out, causing the diaphoresis or the sweating. And that also tells me that the vasoconstriction is probably occurring because there's a perfusion issue within the core vital organs. So these are patients that we need to aggressively evaluate, perform good comprehensive assessments, and try to figure out what could be causing this, this perfusion issue, or deficiency for that matter. Conversely, if the patient appears really flushed or reddened, uh, a lot of times that says that the blood vessels are dilated. So instead of, of shunting blood in toward the core of the body, now the body is actually pushing blood out toward the periphery. And there's a few reasons that that could happen. Allergic reactions cause vasodilation in order to purposely drop the blood vessel or drop the blood pressure and prevent any level of uh, that allergen getting into the tissues. Um, at the same time, heat emergencies are a good example. One of the primary ways that we excrete heat within our body is through respiration and through radiation and evaporation. So by increasing the respiratory rate when a patient is hyperthermic, they are able to breathe off additional hot air or heat. Uh, in addition to that, by shunting blood out toward the periphery and dilating all the blood vessels, it allows a lot of that heat that's transferred throughout the blood to be lost through evaporation and through radiation. So those are, those are different things that I'm going to be evaluating. In addition to that, I could evaluate things uh, such as whether or not the patient is yellow. Um, anytime the patient is yellow or what we call jaundice, that tells us that there's probably something going on with the liver. It's an indication of liver failure. We also have cyanosis or a light blue. And that cyanosis is an indication that the blood is hypoxic. It doesn't have enough uh, oxygen within it. So we could still have an adequate blood pressure, 
that would not necessarily make the patient pale, um, but they could present cyanotic. And that cyanosis would be an indication of some type of respiratory compromise there. Different areas that we can assess the, the skin color would be areas like nail beds, inside the cheek, inside of the lower eyelids. We can also look at the palms. We can look at the base of the feet. Um, and generally, on most Caucasian patients, we can just evaluate the entire body. But or depending on the complexity of the skin, um, the, the darker complexions there will actually uh, make it more difficult to assess by simply looking at the patient. So that's when we would need to examine some of these alternative sites. There's a, a listing of the colors that we just went through. Uh, also temperature. So we can simply use the back of our hand, place it against the patient's forehead or another part of their body to determine the overall temperature. If the patient's pale, I would assume or expect them to also be cool. Because blood transfers heat throughout the body, if I have vasoconstriction, which has shunted all the blood toward the core of the body, it, uh, then I would expect the heat to also be shunted. So patients who are pale are most likely going to be cool. Patients who are flushed are most likely going to be extremely warm or hot to the touch. And then patients within normal parameters should feel appropriate like any one of us do, hopefully, at this very minute. So there's an example of one way that we could assess temperature. Now, assessing temperature this way is different than using a thermometer to assess temperature. Using a thermometer clues us into the potential core temperature of the body. This assessment here clues us into the overall perfusion of the, of the skin, which gives us indications as to whether or not the patient is actually perfusing vital organs appropriately. If the skin is being perfused, we can usually make the assumption that the internal vital organs are as well. So with some pediatric notes to th remember, although children are nothing but little humans, uh, there are some differences between kids and adults. And we've seen that with airway anatomy and management. We see that with vital signs. Um, so in this case here, as we assess capillary refill, um, rather than just looking at the nail bed, we may also look at the top of the hand or foot. Um, and we also know that capillary refill is going to be a much more significant indicator indicator with children than it would be with adults. I rarely, if ever, assess capillary refill in adults, but I always assess it with kids. Again, it's just a lot easier to assess, and it's a lot more reliable in children than it would be in adults. So moving on to pupils. Pupils are going to be uh, probably one of the most comprehensive neurologic exams we can do. So from behind the eyeball itself, we have the optic nerve. And that optic nerve runs back and toward the back of the brain and actually crisscrosses to the opposite side. And what that allows us to do by assessing pupillary response is it clues me into the overall perfusion of the brain in some of the, the further back or more distal areas. We're able to assess pupils to determine whether or not they are the same size, whether or not they respond or react together, uh, the rate at which they do constrict or dilate depending on ambient light conditions. All of these things are quick, easy assessments and tell us a lot about what's going on neurologically with the brain. So it says here that uh, in a dim environment, the pupil will dilate. And what happens is the pupil, which is the, the black center part of the eye, opens up. And in a dim environment, for instance, if you're sleeping at night and you wake up in the middle of the night to, to use the restroom, you have night vision, right? You're able to see. The, the dim lighting from nothing more than your alarm clock or maybe your phone charger or something like that is enough to light up the room and you can see really without much of a problem. Now, if you go to bed at night and the lights are all on and, and everything else and all of a sudden you shut the lights off, it's dark as can be and you can't see anything. And what it is is that your pupils take a while to adjust. But as you wake up, your pupils should be dilated in the dark, allowing you to see the most. If, <clears throat> if somebody walks into the room and flips the lights on you, or flips the lights on right away, um, then your pupils should instantly start to constrict down as they try to adjust to that overall ambient light. So we can do the same thing using a pen light, right? We can shine a light into their eye, watch for that overall pupil con constriction, and we know that the pupils should constrict together, right? If I shine a, a light into the right eye, then both the right and left eye should both constrict. And the same thing on the opposite side. I shine the light in the left eye, I should see both the left and the right eye constrict together. So when we're evaluating pupils, we use the term pearl. 
pupils are equal and reactive to light. So they're the same size, they react together, those are indications that we are intact neurologically. But anytime that the, the pupils change, it can give us big indications as to what might be going on. So let's look at this image here, right? The top picture you see two pupils that are constricted. Now, if this patient were laying in the back of the ambulance and all the lights are on, or they're laying outside and it's a sunny day, that would be normal. I would expect to see their pupils look that way. If their pupils didn't look constricted in high light environments, that would be a suspicion for some type of neurologic issue. Looking at the middle picture then, both pupils are dilated. Under normal circumstances, if it's a, a dim environment, if it's dark out, whatever, I would expect to see their pupils be dilated. The bottom picture shows unequal, and that's going to be a, a huge indicator as to an underlying head trauma, maybe intracranial pressure building up, but that should be a, a huge clue that there is a, a big problem going on there. In addition to that, we look at the rate at which the pupils respond. So if I were to um, shine a light into the eyes of that patient in the middle there with the dilated pupils, the pupils should constrict together relatively quickly. Sometimes it takes a, a few seconds for them to constrict or they constrict real slowly. We call that sluggish. And a lot of times that'll be indicative of some type of depressant on board, maybe be alcohol, marijuana, something like that. If the pupils are dilated, uh, as they are in the middle picture, and it's a highlight environment, um, that tells me that, well, maybe they're on some type of stimulant. Um, just a, a lot of different things, and we'll talk more about pupil response to individual medical and traumatic conditions throughout the semester as we, we come to them, but understand that pupils will really tell you a lot about your patient's underlying medical condition. And you'll see here, right, this pupil is dilated, this one is constricted. Now, many of you, I'm sure, have gone to the eye doctor before and had your pupils dilated. You know, they can do that uh, purposely using medications in order to uh, do different tests or, or make different observations. But short of any type of abnormality with the eye, uh, that otherwise would be very, very irregular and clue us into a big problem. All right, blood pressure, arguably one of the most important components of the vital signs. So blood pressure describes to us the overall pressure within the blood vessels themselves and we know that if we don't have an adequate blood pressure then when we are unable to appropriately perfuse all of the tissues of the body so normal blood pressure for an adult is in the ballpark of 120 over 80 with children we can actually use a formula and that formula is 70 times two eight or two times the age in years so if a patient is seven years old I would take 70 and then I would add two times their age in years, so two times seven is 14. So 70 plus 14, I would expect a seven-year-old's systolic blood pressure to be in the ballpark of 84. Now, there's some wiggle room there. I can add and subtract 10 from that number, and those would be my acceptable ranges. So a seven-year-old with a systolic pressure between 74 and 94, I would consider to be acceptable. As it approaches those outside ranges, or if it exceeds the outside ranges, I have to really start to get, cons uh, get concerned about the overall perfusion quality. Why is their pressure too high, and or why it would be too low? So we use something called a sphygmomanometer. You can say that for fun if you'd like to. And what that does is it measures the overall pressure, right? That's your actual pressure gauge. Um, combined with that, we'll use our stethoscope. And what we're listening to is as, as the blood pressure cuff tightens up, it actually acts as a tourniquet and it occludes the, the blood flow to the extremity. And that's why we typically pump it up to between 160 and 180 for most adults. That should be high enough. And then from there, we slowly let the needle drop. As we're listening with our stethoscope, when we start to hear the thud of the pulse come back, that is the systolic pressure. That is the amount of pressure that the left ventricle is pumping at in order to overcome the the systemic vascular resistance. We're going to continue to hear the thud, 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 thud as the needle drops. Eventually, as that thud goes away and we no longer hear it, that is the description of the diastolic pressure or the amount of residual pressure that's within the blood. So those are that's how we identify the two different pressures. 
from time to time, though, we're unable to hear the blood pressure. Uh, maybe we're in the back of a noisy ambulance or a noisy environment. Maybe the stethoscope isn't working. Maybe we simply have a cold and we're congested and we can't hear very well during that time. So if that's the case, we can do uh, a blood pressure by palpation. So rather than utilizing the cuff here and a stethoscope, we'd utilize the cuff and we would assess the a distal palpable pulse. In this case here, probably the radial site. And I would do the same thing. I'd inflate the cuff to about 160, 180 and allow that needle to slowly drop. And in this case here, once I start to feel the pulse return at the radial site, that is my systolic pressure, but I am unable to get a diastolic pressure using that method. So I would simply describe it as you know, 134 over PELP, right? If that's where I began to feel the, the pulse itself. Um, the process of actually applying the blood pressure cuff and practicing is something that we'll, we'll do in class, but should not be anything that you guys aren't already aware of. Uh, you'll see here at the bottom a little clue on a test question. Position the diaphragm of the stethoscope directly over the brachial pulse or medial anterior elbow. That is something that is on the exam. Um, also know that the, uh, the little plastic piece um, that represents the, the face of the bell of the stethoscope is called the diaphragm. Those are terms that you may see pop up again. So it talks about uh, auscultation, meaning to listen, and then again, palpation is the process by which we would actually feel the blood pressure cuff. So these are all slides that I just covered already, um, and again, stuff that we will continue to evaluate and practice in the classroom. And then the last thing we'll talk about here is overall temperature. We can use a thermometer to get a, uh, a preferably a core temperature or at least a, a peripheral temperature. Uh, several different sites we can use, tympanic being uh, in the ear, temporal meaning the forehead, uh, axillary in the armpit, uh, an oral site under the tongue, and then typically true core uh, temperatures are done uh, rectally, which is not something that is frequently done in the back of the ambulance. Remember that overall body temperature uh, can fluctuate throughout the course of the day. Um, while 98.6 is considered normal for all age groups, um, it is not uncommon for there to be a one degree variance one way or the other. Additionally, with very young children, because their metabolic rate and heart rates are so high, uh, they typically run warm. We wouldn't consider a young child to have a fever or be febrile unless their temperature is, exceeds 100.3 degrees. So there's an example of taking an oral temperature underneath the tongue. Uh, these thermometers work pretty well and usually give us a reading within just a couple seconds. And then we still have oxygen saturation. So I'm sorry, temperature was not the last one. SpO2 or the overall saturation of the hemoglobin. And that's a really important differentiation to make. When we do SpO2, we're not actually evaluating uh, oxygen content whatsoever. What we are evaluating is the saturation of the hemoglobin on the red blood cells. Under normal circumstances, it is going to be oxygen that saturates that hemoglobin. So if it says 97%, that means that the hemoglobin is saturated 97% with oxygen. But there are instances where something like carbon monoxide can actually bind to the hemoglobin and prevent that oxygen uptake. Uh, there are also other issues such as when the pH levels get off from carbon dioxide that prevent the effective, or I'm sorry, the efficient use of the hemoglobin and that's unable to transport as much oxygen in those circumstances. So nonetheless, just know that when we talk about SpO2, um, we assume that it's oxygen, but we don't know that for sure. And what we're truly measuring is just the overall saturation of the hemoglobin itself. There are different uh, ranges for that to determine the level of hypoxia. And what we're looking at then is 96 and above would be considered normal. 91 to 95% is mild hypoxia. 86 to 90% is moderate hypoxia. And 85% or less is considered severe hypoxia. Now we can take those categories and we can look at it a little bit more too. Uh, a young baby, let's say a, uh, a nine month old, has no reason whatsoever to be anywhere below 98%. We would expect a young, a young baby uh, at nine months old to really be probably 99 or 
they should be taking in sufficient amounts of oxygen and they should be able to, to carry that on the hemoglobin and deliver that to the cells without much of a problem. So if I saw a nine month old at 96%, although that falls into the normal range, I'm actually pretty concerned about that because there's, there's very little fluctuation for those young kids. Conversely, as I sit here and talk to you guys right now, I'm probably floating between 94 and 95% myself. I don't smoke, but nonetheless, as we get older, we're exposed to more chemicals. Our bodies work slightly less efficiently as, as age goes on. Um, we're just not able to do it as well as we could. So uh, if I'm looking at my patient, they're in no uh, obvious respiratory distress. They have no complaints whatsoever. And they're sitting at 93, 94%, probably not a big deal. I don't think I would even treat that. Conversely, if they're at 99% as an adult, but they're tripoding, they're breathing hard, um, you know, increased work of breathing and, and just overall look really crappy, um, then I don't really care what this number is. I'm going to treat them aggressively with oxygen, right? I'm going to treat my patient, not the SpO2 monitor in this case. So that's what I'm going to use as my patient's presentation to determine my treatment plan. There's a lot of things that can infect or affect the accuracy of the pulse oximeter. Um, something like nail polish or dirt under the nails could play into it. Um, if the patient doesn't have good circulation to the fingers, uh, maybe they're super cold or something like that, that would impact it. So we also have to look at it and say, okay, this thing's reading 83%, but my patient looks fine. They're not complaining of anything. Is it accurate? And a lot of times what we find is that there is a, a false reading there. Uh, SpO2 is probably my least favorite vital sign. I use it uh, the least. I, I trust it the least. Um, there's a lot that we can do using pulse, respiratory rate, blood pressure, skin parameters, mental status, and all that other stuff that will tell me a lot more about the overall perfusion quality more so than SpO2. Uh, blood glucose meters. So from time to time, we need to assess the sugar level of our patients. And not only would we do this for all of our diabetic patients, but anytime somebody has an altered mental status, one of the first things we should be doing is evaluating their sugar level. Because even in non-diabetics, something simple as trauma or infection can cause the sugar levels to drop relatively quickly in an otherwise healthy adult. So something that we should be checking on a regular basis Lots of different monitors on the market, different procedures when using them, and that's something specific to your organization that you go to work for. You'll learn how to use their equipment. Uh, using a glucometer and obtaining blood glucose is something that is permitted within the state of Illinois for EMTs um, and within our EMS system, so you don't need to worry about that. Again, going over the average or the actual uh, procedure is something we'll do in class. When we're looking at the ranges, our average or normal range is going to be between 80 and 120. It is not a huge problem for the levels to be slightly out of that uh, range. And I would say really anywhere between 70 and probably 140, 150 would be acceptable. Um, once we get outside of that range, I have some pretty big issues that we're concerned about. Uh, we'll talk more about hyper and hypoglycemia in the diabetic chapter, um, but know that the average range for an adult is between 80 and 120. Uh, with adults, our sugar levels fluctuate quite a bit based on meals and activity levels. Um, with kids, though, they're able to maintain a relatively constant sugar level, and that's usually going to be up above 100. So although 80 to 120 is still the acceptable range for kids, we expect it more than likely to be between 100 and 120 as truly their norm. Uh, no different than the SpO2, right? 90. 96 to 100 is considered normal, but for young children, I would expect them to be 98, 99, or even 100 percent. And that wraps that up. That was a very brief overview of some of the most uh, basic vital sign acquisitions that we do. Again, in class, we're going to practice these actual skills. We're going to start talking about end tidal CO2 monitoring, and we're going to get a lot more in-depth with each of these vital signs that we just discussed. So we look forward to seeing you in class, and enjoy the rest of your day.